Today's video is going to be jam-packed with a ton of valuable information, the type of info that uh, just isn't available too frequently on YouTube relating to Blender and modeling and things like that. Um, so I want to talk about a bunch of different things that all of you absolutely need to know if you want to be a proficient hard surface designer, okay? So I made a lot of videos on my channel and I show you how to model, how to use the tools and things like that. But in this video, I want to take it a step further and show you how to design a really simple piece like this completely from scratch, but also focus heavily on detail placement. How exactly am I thinking when I'm modeling and approaching these types of designs? And how do I know where to place the detail to make it look good? Now, before we can even discuss this stuff, you have to at least know how to use Blender, how to use the hard surface modeling tools, and just how to get started. So if you're brand new or maybe you're transitioning over to Blender, pick up our hard surface jumpstart course over on our site. A lot of people have taken it. It's completely free and you're going to learn a ton of information there. So there's a link to that in the top of the description. But without further ado, let's get started with the video. So whenever we start with a fresh blender scene, we want to consider what type of silhouette we want to create. We're never looking at the final result. We're mainly focused on how is the silhouette going to look. And this piece is going to be a more cylindrical form. So whenever you start in a scene, you're usually going to start with a cube, a sphere, or a cylinder. In this case, we're going to use a cylinder. Now what I'm also going to do is go up here and I'm going to turn on the cavity feature. And essentially what the cavity feature does um, is it just kind of highlights the edges of the model and makes it look more visually appealing. You can copy my settings here if you want to have the same ones as me. I prefer this type of setup. And then I also like to change the studio over to this orb. I just think it looks a little bit more soft. I just prefer it. And then what I want to do is give this cylinder 100 vertices. The reason I'm using so many is because I'm not creating any sort of game asset. This is a concept piece. So I'm not concerned with the poly count, I'm concerned with the quality. If I were to make a game asset, of course I'd focus more on poly count, but in this case we're making a concept model, right? So we're going to go ahead and give it 100 vertices, and with hard ops, I'm just going to go ahead and sharpen that to smooth it out. And this is where we can basically begin our modeling process. So whenever I'm kind of sketching these types of models, what I always like to consider is where each detail is getting placed. Every single thing I create has a reason for it. So usually what I'm doing is I'm just kind of playing with shapes, figuring out what looks good, what doesn't, um, what shapes kind of play on each other and what shapes don't. And it just um, it's just consistent practice. You have to put in the reps, guys, to really begin to feel this type of stuff out. So it's not like this thing is going to be, you know, the creativity is going to be developed overnight. It is going to take some time um, and lots of practice. But if you're willing to put in the work and practice a lot, you're going to be a, a top tier artist. So and we're always improving, too. So I just kind of want to have like a rough silhouette kind of giving me the general idea of the model I want to create. So usually once you have a silhouette, what you want to do is introduce more dynamic elements to that model so in the forms of bevels and things like that so usually what i like to do just to kind of avoid these harsh transitions and harsh edges whatever is i like to just introduce some bevels this will give it a more dynamic feel if you're a member of our coaching and community program we actually just released an entire new master class on dynamic elements uh, so feel free to join that it's closing this month so you might not have access depending on when you're watching this video but um yeah, dynamic elements are very, very powerful because basically what they do here is they make the model look softer. Now, it's very easy to overdo these types of elements. What I'll see a lot of people do is just arbitrarily place these, but you can see how the slightest difference completely changes the overall form and feel of the model. So every single element you place like this, you need to do it with consideration, considering how it's going to look. Is that the result you want? Things like that. So... And you can always adjust it later, but I think for right now, this is this is a decent start. Cool, so now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing to the top. And the nice thing about um, having the model centered in the scene is you can always, um, you know, if you make a change up here, I can always just symmetrize to the bottom. If you have like mesh machine, you can do a symmetry or you can do a symmetry with hard ops as well. 
Um, actually, I think this is a good size for the bevel. And basically what we have now is our rough draft. So the next thing I want to think about here is, you know, what types of elements do I want to introduce? And usually, guys, I don't have any specific idea in my head. I just start experimenting with different shapes, different sizes, different effects, all sorts of stuff. I'm not trying to do anything, you know, complex or crazy. I'm literally just going in here to experiment with different shapes, different sizes. Sometimes I'll keep it, sometimes I won't. It really depends. And what I'm always trying to do here is play off shapes that already exist. For example, this angle right here. Sometimes I'll try to play off that shape. So for example, by introducing this, um, this loop right here, that kind of gives me some buffer to kind of make like a little wedge, kind of like that. I can also move that up, right? And, you know, you can just kind of start getting in these little elements that kind of play off of each other and it's a very intuitive feeling guys it's not something i can just explain to you and give you the magic wand to understand it's a very very intuitive feeling that you must develop over time and this is why i really insist that everyone who's you know learning modeling they start kind of experimenting with different shapes different forms because before you start make, making objects that are meant to be functional it's always a good idea just to kind of play with shapes and forms and just get an idea of detail balance, how that works, and how to kind of play off shapes that already exist. It's a very, very powerful skill, guys. So what I want to do now is introduce, you know, another cylinder in here, and this could kind of be, you know, you usually have a rough idea of what you're going for. Like, I know this is going to be like some sort of container, like a barrel or something, but I want to make it cool, sci-fi looking, right? So when I'm introducing new elements, I kind of want to consider, as long as it's not like a shape study, I'm trying to consider like what's the functionality behind this. So for example, if I introduce the cylinder in here, maybe, maybe this could be, you know, where some sort of liquid is stored or something. And this is where you can start getting creative and thinking outside the box and, you know, creating something that actually has a practical use to it. And this is where you can begin combining form and function together. You know where to place the elements. Then the next step is um, figuring out the functionality behind it. A lot of people do it like inverse. They set up the function first and then deal with the form later. It's, you know, I agree with that rule. I just don't think about it that way. Like when people are saying, you know, form follows function and this and that. It's not really something I'm thinking about. It's something I'm feeling as I work. And it just kind of all comes together naturally. As I'm designing the thing, I'm kind of throwing different shapes together that look cool. But simultaneously, you know, I'm also creating functional elements. So when you hear people talk about form and function and things like that, um, they most likely have a point. It's just I would recommend not getting too obsessed with that type of thing because then you start thinking about, oh, should I make this piece first or this piece second? No, just just feel it out. That's really all you need to do. So this could kind of be like a container perhaps where like, you know, some oil is stored or something. Now we kind of have like the rough draft going on, right? Now what we could start doing is introducing some more visual elements kind of in here. So there's so many different ways to do this. For example, I could take, I could take this piece right here and maybe what I could actually do is, let's pull this back. Maybe scale this a bit on the y-axis, kind of like that. And then what I could do is I could duplicate this piece, just do an Alt-S to scale it along the normals, and then this could actually be the piece that ends up cutting through the model. So now what we've kind of done here is we've introduced like this cool little like um, element just kind of on the inside. And what this does is it just adds an additional level of visual appeal without disrupting the functional elements we're trying to create, right? So I think that looks kind of cool. So I'm going to keep it. And we could always, you know, kind of play with that, figure out where we want to position it. You're going to want to use Alt S if you want to move that in. But I think that's a good spot. And we can do a do a quick symmetry. Actually, this is live, so we'll have to do a mirror. Kind of like that. It looks good. And pretty soon here, I'm going to be showing you some very, very powerful techniques. But for right now, I just want to get the rough draft set up here. So you can already see within a few minutes of time, we already have this cool looking model. 
and all I'm really doing is just building on top of the forms that I already have so um, nothing super complex so I think the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this down just a bit maybe I don't know how far I want to move that down maybe something like that just that way it's not super even so you know the top and the bottom aren't the same size it just kind of has a little bit more um, it, the the symmetry is kind of broken is what I'm doing there however this also broke this effect which I did not necessarily want so maybe I'll actually undo that maybe I'll do that for the bottom I don't know I'd have to think about it but it's not a priority right now at least so this piece right here, I'm going to introduce another cylinder. And you're going to see as I go through this process, guys, I don't have anything pre-planned. So a lot of times, um, you know, I'm going to be undoing changes. I'm going to be adding things, removing things, and just thinking through the entire process. So when you see my videos, don't expect that, you know, I'm doing it off the top of my head. Usually types of videos you watch by people are pre-planned. They've already made the model before and they're just trying to make the tutorial efficient. But for actual real workflow, usually I'm always making changes. So hopefully that kind of gives you a bit of relief if you think I'm like, you know, I think of things immediately. I usually don't. So we're just going to introduce maybe another element in here. Just do something like that. And you're going to see just the more I stack these elements, the more we kind of have these implied functional details. So for example, this could be like a protective case around the container, right? And perhaps this could be the actual container that we store stuff in. And then maybe in the top, we could put like a cap. And you start thinking about all these different functional elements that you can introduce into your design. And it just becomes kind of a game, figuring out what's going to look cool, what's not. And you can always you know, keep making changes as long as you're working more or less non-destructively. So I'm just going to apply that and then just give a nice bevel right there just to kind of hug that. And then maybe right here we could introduce a chamfer, but kind of, you know, move that down a little bit. And then just introduce a little bevel right there, a little bevel right here. And um, by the way, whenever you bevel an edge that has a sharp marking on it like this, notice how it's marked blue. Um, if it's marked um, like that, you're going to kind of see we have these sharp elements along the edge. So with hard ops, I usually recalculate it. You could either remove these manually, right click to clear the sharp, or with hard ops, you just press Q, control shift, left click to recalculate that, and uh, that'll fix it. I don't want to go into too much detail behind the hard ops operations because I really want to focus on the design of this thing. Okay, so I think we're at a pretty good spot where we have a decent, you know, a decent form here. We kind of have the general idea established. And now what we can start doing is introducing the details that are going to really make this thing pop. And the best way to do this is with bevels. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to apply everything, honestly. Smart apply. And you're going to see, actually, before we smart apply everything, let me let me see what I might want to do first. So maybe what I'll do is just do this one at a time. Maybe I'll apply the first Boolean. And what we can do, guys, is we can start introducing bevels to make this thing feel a lot softer and a lot more visually appealing. So for example, um, what I'm going to do here is, first of all, introduce a bevel right there. Not worried about the topology. This is not, this is a concept piece, like I said. And what we could do is, I don't need any of this garbage. Just dissolve that. And then what I can do is go down here. And this entire element, this entire edge, what I can do is bevel it. But you're going to see I can't bevel it super far because we eventually hit these vertices next to it. So not really a big deal. I just dissolve those out or could even slide those back merge that there even you know there's a bunch of different solutions we could use um, but basically I want to I want to get a nice bevel on the inside here so once again we don't have too much of a buffer zone so what I might do is just I'll just dissolve that it's fine don't have to be super picky with this 
as long as I have enough space for a nice bevel, we can do that. Cool. And what this does is it introduces this really nice soft element on the inside, this type of machined look that you might see like on a real life version. And no, I'm not worried about the shading artifacts because once again, it's a concept piece. If the shading really bothers me, um, you know, I can always just fix up the surrounding geometry or there's so many different solutions, but um, mostly I'm not too worried about the shading here. Maybe introduce a, hmm, I could join that. Kind of help it out. Cool. And then I'm just going to go ahead and symmetrize over. And it looks like the mirror is taking care of the rest. So this is a pretty decent element. I could honestly even push this bevel further. And to do that, I'll probably need to, let's see, how far can I push this bevel? Push it to right about there. It should be fine. Yeah, I think just as long as we have a nice, you know, machined look, we'll be fine. Cool, so we have that. And now what I want to do is apply this next Boolean this one to be specific. And what I could do here is bevel these edges like that. Symmetrize over. And you're gonna see it kind of messes up on this side, but I'm not worried about this side at all because we have a mirror modifier taking care of that side. So basically, the only side that matters is this little portion because the mirror modifier takes care of the other side, so no big deal this geometry isn't really doing anything that you know this pinch geometry right here doesn't matter because the mirror modifier is overriding it cool so now we have a nice little dynamic element there using a bevel could do the same thing on the bottom but we already did it so we'll just symmetrize to the bottom that's the power of having you know symmetrical objects like this and usually what you could do is just introduce a bevel modifier but what i've been doing a lot more recently is having full control over my bevels. And the best way to do that is by actually introducing these bevels manually. So if you were to be using a software like Moi 3D, you'd have to work destructively anyways. That's just how the softwares work. But um, in this case, I could bevel it, but we're going to get some nasty shading artifacts. So this is a good time to introduce an offset cut with Mesh Machine because it'll eat the surrounding geometry. So this is effectively turning a polygon workflow into a CAD workflow. And so if you're one of the people that are going to ask, you know, why don't you use CAD? It's because I'm way more efficient in Blender. I know the hotkeys. I know the tools. I know I'm going to be way more efficient and get the same results as CAD um, in Blender here. So that's why I do that. And you're going to see by just introducing these small little bevels right here, we already have such a nice um, reflection of the light and just a really defined form on the mesh. And this is why I really love introducing these bevels because they just make the whole thing look completely different um, compared to before. Cool, so now what I'm gonna do is, let's work on the inside. We can go ahead and apply this one and press forward slash on the numpad to isolate that. So, looks good here. What I might do actually before I apply that is introduce some loop cuts in here because if I introduce loop cuts on the cutter, what that's going to do is it's going to um, force that geometry onto the mesh here. So the shading is going to be pretty much perfect. So it looks good. So now that we have that, what I want to do is click. We'll alt click with mesh machine to select all the way around. And I could just press control B in this case, but it still looks like we're going to get some overlap. So once again, this is a good time to introduce an offset cut and just let Mesh Machine do its magic and we don't have to deal with any of it. And we'll do a symmetry to the other side and just like that, we have a nice bevel on the top and uh, on the bottom as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this portion down just a bit, maybe to about here, just so that way we have a little bit of um, bias towards one side. And this is where we're gonna really start stacking the detail placement and the ideas behind 3D visual design to really make this look not only functional, but also have a really clean form. I notice a lot of people can do one or the other, but combining them, especially for me, is probably the hardest part, being able to combine that functional element of your model, but also have a really nice form definition to it.
So what I'm going to do is introduce some handles up here. So now that I'm, you know, really getting into the um, elements that are kind of focused on the top, in the back of my head, I'm kind of thinking about, all right, how can I start clustering detail kind of towards the top and balance the detail in such a way that it's still functional, but the form is also really clean. And, you know, as I'm stacking more elements to the top, you'll kind of see how I'm working. But I want to introduce some handles up here. That's going to be yet another functional element. Of course, this is going to need to be carried by someone. So to do that, we just need to introduce a handle. And I have no clue why the geometry is playing with me right here. Let me, let me try cleaning it with machine tools and maybe applying this mirror will help. Sometimes the geometry might just be buggy for whatever reason. See, this could be a multitude of things. It could be like non-manifold geometry. It could be, it could be quite a few things actually. It's curious. For whatever reason, that spot seemed to work, but still messing with me. So let me try taking a look on the inside here. Is there any weird? Uh, I think I see. For some reason, we have a bunch of overlapping geo right here. So. This is where, you know, sometimes you'll be working in Blender and you'll just have to figure some stuff out on your own. Looks like right here we actually had an absolute mess, but we can fix that very easily. Knowing how to diagnose these issues and fix them is an essential skill, by the way. So I'm going to literally just delete that out and we're just going to patch this up. Not that big of a deal. We'll do a four all the way down and basically all the way down that's fine cool so yeah sometimes you'll have little issues like that that just completely mess with your workflow I'm not too worried about it though so what I'll do here is alt click and we're gonna need to bridge these together right click we'll bridge those edge loops then for this portion all the n-gons and such um, what I'm gonna do is just fill that it's gonna have a shading stretch right there but not something I'm super concerned with I could even isolate it by just dropping another loop you're always gonna have some sort of shading issues so you know it's a matter of just managing them and like I said this is a concept piece so I'm focused more on uh, creating a cool design less about any sort of complex topology that doesn't matter in this case, but that completely fixed the issue. So and whenever I make a mistake or I have issues in the model or I just completely fuck something up, I'm not going to throw it out of this video. I want to show you what happens when things go crazy and how to kind of identify and fix them because there's so many different things that could be happening. But the more you run into those situations, the more you know where to look, right? It's like if your car breaks down and I don't know shit about cars, but someone who does might be able to know exactly what might be causing the issue, right? Maybe it's the alternator, the engine, I don't know. But basically what I'm saying is the more you run into issues, um, those are good. So don't get frustrated when you do. It's going to teach you a lot. So we kind of have like a handle here. It doesn't need to be a super large handle. And this is once again where I'm going to really be playing with the placement. Making sure it looks good. Mirroring it to the other side. Do a quick symmetry like that. And you're going to see this looks pretty clean. And usually what I'll do is I'll turn off the overlays just so I can kind of move things around and see it without any distraction. So I don't want to push this too close like that. It's way too close. Doesn't look good. Clashes a bit with that corner. I also don't want to push this too far away because then we don't really have a handle there. It's, you know, imagine that thing's supposed to be like gripped through or whatever. So maybe just scale that up a bit. I think we can get away with that. Didn't really want to center it like that, but it's not um, not a deal breaker. Cool. And at this point, we're just gonna control click sharpen to apply it, and then we can bevel here. This one, I don't really need to use an offset cut because it seems like it's beveling just fine without overlaps. Um, I can turn off loop slide. I might have spoke too soon. We could also try reconnecting some of these. Sometimes doing reconnections like this will um, help.
help you if the geometry doesn't want to flow nicely. Turn off loop slide, that doesn't work. So yeah, it, it is overlapping a little bit too soon. You can see right here. So I can bevel to about this point, then it starts overlapping. So um, it doesn't hurt to use an offset cut if you really want to. I just didn't really think I needed to in this case. Increase the factor value a bit. I don't know, let's just see how this looks beveled to that point. Hmm, it's a tough one. Maybe what I'll do instead is connect that there because that's not really orthogonal of a connection. There we go, now we have a lot more space, that should be fine. Looks good. And now we have this really clean machine looking bevel, something that you get in you know, CAD. Looks real nice. Then the back, we can do the same thing. Back, eh, how far can I push this? Not too far. I'm just going to offset cut. Save myself the headache. Bevel it. And boom, there we go. Now we have the back sorted. Looks very, very nice. So you're going to begin to see we have a lot of visual detail placed towards the front. We have a circular element here, then another one hugging it. And then we have the handles and then we have, you know, the upper portion and a lot of the, um, you know, when you look at this model, the first place you're going to be focusing here is now towards the top, which is good because from a functional position, this is where it's going to matter the most. You know, there's going to be a lid here eventually, and that's where all the focus needs to go Two, uh, the empty space is very powerful because it signifies areas of importance on the model. So you can start combining form to emphasize the function of your design and attract the viewer to the area they really need to be focusing on. And that's kind of what I've done here. So at this point, I don't really, I can't really symmetrize to the bottom any longer because it's no longer symmetrical on the Z axis. So um, any changes I make will have to be manual from now on, but no big deal. So we have this really clean looking design so far. And how about we introduce the lid? How about we just hop in here, drop another cylinder, and the lid doesn't have to be like massive, but it doesn't need to be tiny either. Just kind of think from like a intuitive human position, how exactly would this look? So maybe there's like, I don't know, a difference boolean here, and then maybe I could solidify this, and that could kind of be like the element representing the lid. And then I could turn off overlays and just kind of see like which spot looks the best. Maybe you want a lid that big. I don't know. I don't think that looks good. I think something like this is a lot more reasonable. And now we're just stacking elements towards the top, which is very, very powerful. So let's go ahead and, oops, let's go ahead and sharpen that. And I'm gonna press the L key in vertex mode to separate this so it's a separate piece. And then we can bevel this. And then this will be the lid, so we can bevel the lid there. And now we have this beautiful separation from the, from the bevels there. You probably can't see it with YouTube's compression, but we do have a very minor shading artifact here on the top. See it? I'm just going to go ahead and alt-click on Sharpen to apply a weighted normal. You can always do it in here as well. And that'll flex the shading for you. Looks good. And we're just going to keep stacking this. So now at this point, you can just focus purely on the lid. You could even use some reference photos. How would a lid look in a container? I don't know. But I kind of imagine like maybe there's like another hole in here, right? I can do that and even introduce like a little chamfer in there, right? And then maybe introduce a nice bevel in that. And then we could do like, um, we could inset this and extrude it down. Bevel here and then bevel here. And then the more you stack these types of elements, the more of this cool looking effect we have on this entire model. So could even expand this selection a bit, kind of pull that up. And just like that, guys, we're just echoing elements we already have. The circular element kind of radiates out in this very nice positioning. And then maybe what I could do is add in like a small little line in here. And maybe there's like a some sort of tool that opens this that kind of fits in between this. So I could rotate that for some 
cool looking effect and then just make that a little bit smaller and then we kind of have this cool looking effect couldn't even move it if I wanted to yeah I think that'll be fine looks all right and guys, don't be afraid to use what I call implied functionality, which is where you basically have elements that could be interpreted as functional, but in the real world, it may or may not have a functional application, if that makes sense. Like this line down here, I just thought it looked cool. I don't know what the hell it does. It probably does nothing, but you can just kind of stack that type of stuff just for fun. That's what I always do. Let me also, no, I don't just put a bevel modifier on this one. We'll go to about there. A little bit of some artifacting going on, but I can just dissolve those out. So that way that doesn't happen. Same for the inside here. We'll need to, let's just dissolve that out. Just to kind of avoid that weird artifacting we had going on. There we go, it's fine. And then we'll put a way to normal modifier. Very nice. So now the question is, what could we do to the body of this thing just to bring even more detail in? So you can imagine from a truly functional standpoint that, you know, this is probably enough. You have this container on the inside and it probably serves its purpose. It You can put liquid in it or store whatever you're storing in there. This whole entire design has basically served its purpose at that point. But when it comes to the visual elements and other things that you might want to add to make it look more interesting, that's really where you're going to be able to sell your model by introducing more form-fitting elements while simultaneously complementing the functional elements of your design. So, for example, there's a few things missing. I could introduce like handles here in the front. I could do all sorts of things, but this is where you can really get creative with it. So, for example, I could add in some cool little effect here. Maybe it's like a handle or like an attachment goes in. It could be anything, but I don't want to center this. A lot of people have this really nasty habit. I don't want to say nasty habit, but um, it's not the best habit where they try to center things. They basically just put things right in the center and they think that's how they're supposed to do it. And it's because we're so, we're so used to, you know, keeping things very monotone and symmetrical. But once you start kind of biasing elements, you know, according to 7030, keeping things kind of biased in one area as opposed to centering things, that's where your designs are going to really begin to pop and just excel way beyond what you had before. But you're going to see we still have some issues when I try to run this. I don't know what's causing it. Let's just try changing this to exact. I don't know what the hell is causing that. Let me undo this can delete that and clearly there's some additional geometry in here that is just not liking us today so let me try this again let me try let me try putting something in the center just seeing if the center even works okay so we know the issue is not there the issue is somewhere when I extend this make it larger so push that back to about this point push it back further but it looks like we have some non-manifold geometry just some weird stuff going on back there um, but I don't want to push this all the way through anyways I just want to put it to about this point so that's fine I'm gonna put it a little bit lower maybe so it's still towards the top but it's not too close and even the slightest changes guys can make a hell of a big difference so like here looks way worse than maybe like right here you don't want to stack it too close but you still want to have it like on that upper third so it looks good we can do that and then I'm just gonna go ahead and give this a really nice large bevel nothing crazy yeah it looks good and maybe just make this a little bit shorter Okay, very nice. And then we're just gonna go ahead and apply that. And here we're gonna need to, we could try to bevel it, but it looks like we're gonna need an offset cut to handle that mess. So 
I'll set the factor there to the factor just increases that corner resolution. So maybe oh, something like that. Put a nice little bevel in there. Can also um, yeah, we don't need to mirror it to the other side. That's fine. And there we go. Now we have this cool element here in the front. We can do the same thing, you know, just introducing these small little enhancing elements can really just make the design look a lot more cared for, which is what I'm trying to do here. So maybe do something like this. Let's make this bevel a little bit bigger. Do something like that. And then let's mirror this to the other side. So this could actually be cool, but the first thing I want to do is play with that size. Something like that could be okay. And then I want to either move it closer or back further. I think right around here could be good. Let's see, move this back. I think that could be pretty cool. Let me move this down just a bit, so it's not too big. I don't really know what this is, just like a cutout to make it look a bit more visually appealing. It's kind of up to you if you want to add that. I think it could be a nice complement to this whole form, while still retaining the empty space. So let's try it. What I'm going to go ahead and do is apply that Boolean. And then here we can't really bevel it. Um, let me flip the normals, shift N. Can't exactly bevel this. We're gonna need to use an offset cut. Do something like that. Not that big, but so we can have a nice bevel in there. Looks good. Shading's a little bit messy around the top here, but what I'm gonna actually do is just isolate that with a knife cut. So now the shading is basically pushed in. It should be fine. Looks good to me. You could even try using a Boolean cleanup if you wanted to. Oftentimes that'll help clean the shading as well. Cool. So this is looking pretty decent. What I probably should have done, I forgot about it, but what I probably should have done here on the actual boolean as I should have ran some vertical loops through it because now we have these really nasty shading stretches all the way through. As a matter of fact, I'm going to undo it because I probably should have done that before. So let me run some loops through there because what that's going to do is now when I apply this, we're going to have a lot of those vertical loops on it, which is going to help the shading stay clean. So that's good. I'm going to even run a boolean cleanup beforehand, maybe. Now we'll run offset cut first, like that. And then we could, of course, run our, let's do a knife cut right at the top there just to kind of push in that shading. And then we could run a Boolean cleanup just to help it out. Cool, very nice. Now I think the next thing I could do is echo some of these elements here towards the top just to make this a little bit more focused because we have a lot of detail on this piece, but on this piece right here we don't really have anything. So what I might actually do is I might just run a random, a turn off knife, just run a random cut like this, like that, we'll press the T key, then press, I'm sorry, the X key, and then X again. That'll be an inset. So we kind of have this inset effect and then I can apply that. And now we just kind of have a little bit more visual elements kind of pushed towards the top to really bring in that focus. Um, right here, let me, let me keep these at a one-to-one -one correspondence. So what I mean by that is we don't want this random thing. We want to make sure these are corresponding to each vertex. We actually studied this. I took a graph theory class in college and we studied a lot of um, this type of theory, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence with vertices and that type of thing. It, it, all these 3D softwares guys are um, built on graph theory. It's a very fascinating subject. 
I'm missing one. Here it is. Cool. And then what I could do here, if I try to alt click, uh, Blender doesn't know where to select. Um, it's, actually, yeah, it does. We're good. What I was going to say is you could quadrify this just for fun by pressing Control T, Alt J. Whenever you have a one to one correspondence like this, right? But you have a big end gone here, you can always Control T, Alt J just to quadrify it. So, I mean, it doesn't hurt. We don't really need to, but it doesn't hurt, I suppose. And then what I can do is it immediately knows what to select now, which is cool. So I'm going to bevel that. I'm going to bevel this. Now we have a nice bevel. And then maybe I'll stack one more time. E to extrude, Alt S. And then we'll just give this a bevel modifier, because why not? I'm going to move this in a little bit more. There we go. So now we kind of have this cool little element here. Just makes it, this piece, a little bit more visually appealing. And we've also biased this towards the top and not in the center. So very powerful. So we have a lot of primary elements and a lot of secondary elements. And it's always a good idea to introduce tertiary elements if you want to make it look even cooler. So a few different things we could do. Maybe we could add some like little notches here around the crate. I guess we don't have to, but I think it'd be kind of cool. So let's add in, hmm, how do I want to do it? Let's add in a cube. Take this cube, scale it down. We'll go to face snap. We just snap it there. RZZ45, something like that. Then maybe up here we can put some little notches. Move that in. So maybe I could bevel the top and then chamfer the bottom. I don't know. I'm just playing with different shapes. And then around the side, I could bevel that. And then mirror. And then mirror again. So we kind of have that effect. And then we can kind of figure out, you know, where exactly do we actually want to place this? Maybe here, and these could be a bit larger, right? And of course, we're going to want to fuse these to the actual surface here. So we really see that difference. So I'll pull that out a bit. I can go ahead and apply that mirror. And we're going to shift click. Actually, yeah, that's fine. Um, we're going to apply the mirror. And we're going to shift click on the main mesh. And we're going to run a union boolean like that. So once we've applied or added that union, I'm going to need to apply it. So I have access to this geometry around it. So I can just give a nice bevel on that, right? So now it's actually fused to the mesh. The only problem here is we have this really long, nasty shading stretch. So I could isolate it with a loop. You know, I could do something like this. And the shading is basically going to be isolated. But you're still going to have a little bit of issues around it. You can kind of see it. So this is actually a good situation to use what we call a normal transfer. So check this out. This is very powerful. Um, what I'm going to do, let me symmetrize these. What I'm going to do is add in another cylinder. I'm going to scale the cylinder up right until it hides that shading. So right, right there. So now the shading's hidden. See it? Cool. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to scale it down just so that way it kind of encompasses the areas that have that bad shading. So about this portion, right? Maybe a little bit more. Cool. And what we're going to do is we're going to rename the cylinder here to just anything really. I'll just call it normal transfer. And what we need to do is we need to select the main object. We can hide this too. We're going to select the main object. We're going to add a data transfer modifier. The source is going to be that cylinder we just added in. I called it normal transfer. And then we're going to go to face corner data, custom normals, and then projected face interpolated. And we're going to have a mess. And the reason we have a mess here is because it's trying to apply the normal transfer to the entire object, but this piece is only covering a certain portion. So the rest is just going crazy. Basically, with normal transfers, you only want to affect the areas with the bad shading. So in this case, it would just be here. So what I'm going to do is assign a vertex group to those faces. So now those are selected. 
and if I put the vertex group in here, now the normal transfer is only going to affect those faces. And you're gonna see it's still a little bit, a little bit messy. So what I might do is play with this a bit. Hmm, interesting. What we might need to do is let's introduce a loop up here. Introduce another one. We'll just try to isolate it a little bit. Sometimes that'll actually help it. Then we can join those together. And we'll just add a new vertex group. So we'll remove that. And this will be our new vertex group. And um, there we go. Looks like it fixed it. Cool. So now if I go back into the mat cap, you're going to see the shading is actually perfect here. And if I turn it off and on, see the difference there? I could even go into one of these. That one doesn't work. Let's try this. Do something like that. You can kind of see the shading pinches around there or whatever. They're pretty obvious if you look at it from an angle. But now when we have that data transfer modifier, it completely goes away. And that's the power of using one of those. So now all I need to do is just symmetrize and symmetrize again. Looks like these sides are fine, which is perfect. And now we have perfectly clean shading on those connection points, which is awesome. And guys, this is basically it. This is essentially the entire process of creating a model that not only has a really clean form to it, but that also has some functionality attached. So you can really start creating these cool looking models following you know all the concepts I teach you, but you can actually give it a little bit of functionality. So this is very clearly to anyone who you know looks at this thing, it's pretty obvious this is some sort of container, especially if you texture it and put some logos on it. Pretty much immediately tells the viewer that this is some sort of storage device, maybe an oil container or something. Whereas in some of my other videos, I make more abstract forms and those are the ones people ask, well, what does it do? So that's the difference between focusing solely on form, but also creating something that has a proper function to it as well. So basically, if people ask you, what is this? And, but like they genuinely have no idea what it is, that probably implies that you've mainly focused on form and less on the function. Whereas if people kind of have an idea of what this piece is meant to be, given the context of the scene or the render, then you have successfully created a functional object and hopefully you've also attached really nice clean forms to it as well, which is what I wanted to focus on in this video. And just to summarize, um, you know, we have so many different videos discussing visual design in 3D. We have a full course, the Blender Bros design course, if you want to pick that up, shameless plug. <laughs> um, but yeah, th th there's so many different things worth covering, but I really wanted to focus on the most essential ones here which were kind of detail stacking, echoing the elements, adding elements that look cool but also have some functionality to it. All these different things are gonna really begin to make your models pop. But most importantly, start adding bevels like this to your models because bevels catch the light very nicely and they completely change the look of your model. So add bevels as much as you can. They're very, very powerful. If this video gave you any sort of value, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up. If you have any sort of feedback, you know, let me know in the comments. I um, love hearing what you guys have to say, and it's the best way to learn from other people as well. You guys might have some stuff that I don't know. So that's it for this video. Uh, head over to our website as well, blenderrose.com. We have a lot of hard surface modeling resources on there, free and paid. So check out some of that stuff if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.